You're listening to Carrie Lutz's Financial Survival Network, where you get valuable information you just can't find anywhere else. To thrive in today's trying times, you need the Financial Survival Network, now more than ever. Go to FinancialSurvivalNetwork.com and get your free newsletter and gift. Financial Survival Network, now more than ever. Welcome. You are watching, listening to the Financial Survival Network. I'm Kerry Lutz. And, well, the war in Ukraine continues on. Markets are disrupted around the globe. But how badly has it really affected markets? And what can we look forward to? Well, we wanted to get a European perspective, somebody who uh, really uh, lives right down the road from Ukraine. And... Is here to talk about it. I'm talking about uh, Octavio Morenzi, apemis.com. Octavio, it's great to have you back on the show. So the war is literally in your backyard. And we got markets, uh, we got commodities going higher, we got gold going higher, we had oil, you know, heading towards its near all time high. I should mention it's, it's March 22nd. Um, and yet the U.S. markets kind of like yawned at all this. Uh, is this manipulation or is this uh, capitulation or is it just denial? <laughs> I mean, there's the three choices you give me that I'm not sure which one I, I would pick. But I, I think overall, I, I think it's sort of a sense that from a U.S. perspective, the U.S. economy, this is not a conflict that is going to have that much of an impact. So certainly... Uh, for the for the Russian stock market, it's been disastrous. For the Ukrainian, they don't even talk about that. It's been an absolute uh, awful, awful time. And for many European stock exchanges as well, but not as bad as you might think. But if you were to look at the Nasdaq stock prices or the Dow Jones Industrial Average or things of that sort, you would not be able to detect where the Ukrainian war started uh, on, on this chart. So if I were to, to lay a Nasdaq uh, composite index chart in front of you and say, pick out where the war in Ukraine started, it'd be really hard to do that. Uh, and I think so. So I, I want to say it's been a bit of a yawn for the financial markets in the US, but it hasn't been that enormous impact that we might have expected at the beginning. The, the other thing I think is all the sort of things about commodity prices, um, and in particular oil and natural gas. Now, in European natural gas, we have seen prices spike quite severely and, and jump back and forth very erratically, depending on whether people thought a peace treat was near or not, whether the fighting would continue, or would Russian gas supplies be cut off or not. So there's been a very erratic trading passions in, in, in European natural gas, but not in US natural gas. There's been fairly separate because they are kind of separate markets. And sometimes people think that there's sort of a fungible asset natural gas. It really isn't. Uh, it's not really conceivable to ship natural gas from the US to Europe or, or vice versa. So they are actually separate markets and behaviors if they are. It's not like the world market for oil, which is really one unified market. Markets for natural gas tend to be much more regional and, 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 and local national. So if we, if we look at oil prices, they, we saw a big run up in oil prices uh, before the war started. So the price of oil went all the way from $65 a barrel up to $95 a barrel, an increase of almost 45% before there was an inkling really of the war in Ukraine starting. And since that, it's gone a bit further. So it's gone up another 15, 20%. But the big run happened before. So it seems that the price of oil was able to go up without a war in Ukraine. And I think it comes back basically to the central banks pumping money into the economies and, and driving up prices that way. And that has now all this easy liquidity, easy money, Money we've seen over uh, years and years now is really manifesting itself in the form of inflation now and really screams in terms of the central banks to address it and, and get that under control. All right. So we get our first rate hike in the US. Um, I don't remember how many years it was since 2017 or 18. And the promise of uh, more to come. Do you believe them? Can they really both do QT, quantitative tightening, and rate hikes and not uh, blow everything up? I, I think it's going to be very difficult to do because there's large segments of the economy that either consciously or unconsciously have become dependent on very easy money. So there might be certain sectors of activity in terms of trading, investments and things of that sort, or buying houses and the construction and real estate and things like that, that are quite explicitly dependent on low interest rates. And as interest rates increase, those things will have a, a, a correction. There's other kinds of activities you might think 
sort of indirectly are dependent on on low interest rates and even don't even know it or realize it. But they're all over the place. And it's so infused down to the economy. Once you take that support away, uh, things are going to be ugly for at least some time while the economy readapts and readjusts to that. So that's what the Fed is going to have to go through. Now, they did have this 25 basis point increase, which is a very tepid increase. I mean, it's not, it's not a dramatic increase at all. And I don't remember ever such a small interest rate increase being announced with such fanfare over so much time. So I really do question how how serious Jay Powell is about fighting inflation, because it's not an increase from zero to 0.25% that's going to make the difference, or even half a percent or even 1%. I mean, he's going to have to increase interest rates very, very aggressively for an extended period of time to get this to work. And he will crash the markets by doing that. And there'll be all sorts of sectors of the economy that need to readjust and and give up on the easy money because that there's such a dependency there. So I don't see how he's going to do that. Um, I don't think it's possible. He's going to increase interest rates for a while, I think, still to come. And I think eventually he's going to throw in the towel and say, wow, I crashed the stock market now. It's gone down 30%, 40%. I better jump back in and support it and start the quantitative easing all over again. So how do you play this as an investor? You get out it's of the very, market now? Yeah. I personally have gone out of the market now. I, I don't know if that's a recommendation I would make to anyone else, but I can just talk about what I've personally done is basically sitting on cash for a bit. But that's a risky, risky thing to do in an inflationary environment. I mean, you don't want to be sitting on cash uh, as uh, inflation eats into your savings and into your investments. So it's a, it's a risky proposition. But I'm thinking that Powell is going to have another quarter point, a quarter point or half point increase and the markets will not react well. Though today they seem to be doing okay, but who knows on a day-to-day basis is impossible to say. But I think there will be a a correction there in terms of the markets, even more than we've seen so far. And then at some stage he will uh, reverse course and say, okay, now we've done enough of this. We need to we need to support the markets again. And I think that's the point at which you want to jump in. So I, I I'm basically expecting a correction in the market. Uh, a going down another 10, 20%, maybe even more. Uh, And then we'll see the Fed jump back in and basically say, okay, we've done enough now. We need to make sure the markets don't have a a spillover effect into Main Street and and keep that under control. Yeah, we've done enough damage for for a year. Let's, Let's go back. You know, I was mentioning to my last guest, everybody talks about Volcker with 20% interest rates, but that was only part of the equation. The other thing, and uh, I'd venture to say you're old enough like me to remember, is there was a cutting of credit, mostly consumer credit, um, but even business credit was hard to come by during that time. And as a result, uh, you know, credit limits on credit cards almost universally were reduced substantially, third to 50%. So this slowed down the creation of money which uh, had the effect of almost throwing the world into a uh, another Great Depression. And then uh, kind of Reagan marched into ta- town at that point. And then Volcker started cutting rates and the rest is history. And Ronald Reagan got the credit for it. His, his timing was immaculate. Um, I mean, yeah, in life. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Timing is important uh, in life and in markets and everything else. Um, Yes. So, so are we going to see a repeat of that? I'm, I'm not sure. I mean, I, I, th- I think uh, Jay Powell is no Paul Volcker. You know, I, I, I don't think they are cut to the same cloth. I think Paul Volcker, as soon as he, he, he took over, he really aggressively jacked up interest rates. He didn't do these 25 basis points increase. He was doing full one percent increases, uh, and, and really jacked up things high. And for an extended period of time, I mean, he had the Fed funds rate above 10 percent for three years. I know, and we've been we've been at zero now for I don't even know how many years, but uh, at least since since 2018, and before that we were basically at zero as well. So that's that's almost unthinkable in today's terms. If you think about it, increasing interest rates that much, up to the Fed fund rates above 10 percent, all the way up to 15 percent, and that for multiple years, I mean, that will will devastate the markets. And inflation back then wasn't so far away from where it seems to be going now. So we're sort of on a, on, on a similar course. But I, Jay Powell is not that kind of aggressive inflation fighter. I mean, he had his chance back in 2018, probably, to head this off. They were increasing interest rates, and the markets 
of course, didn't agree with him and didn't agree well. And there was some unpleasantness in the markets and he backed away very, very quickly. So I think he'll do that again. We've seen we've seen his modus operandi once before. I don't see why it would be any different this time. Yeah, well, a leopard can't change its spots. Don't listen to what people say. Observe what they do because actions uh, speak way louder than words. So gold looking ahead. Obviously, right today, it's down 20 something dollars. It's a kind of meaningless move. We've seen tremendous volatility in the sector, but we've seen a new floor put in at uh, somewhere around $1,900. And is it going to stay? Is it going to retest that uh, floor? Go back, uh, go back into 1800s, even 1700s, assuming the Ukraine uh, war is settled uh, shortly. Or is this just the beginning? Don't just survive, thrive. The Financial Survival Network. Fury Gold Mines is a Canada-focused exploration and development company committed to aggressively growing its scalable high-grade gold assets with major drill campaigns planned across its 3.5 million ounce portfolio. Fury is led by a management team of proven explorers and developers with a track record of success in advancing and financing project development. Fury Gold Mines is well positioned to create value for investors with low risk development growth and the potential for a new major discovery. Fury Gold Mines trades on the TSX and NYSE American under the ticker F-U-R-Y. To learn more, go to furygoldmines.com. That's furygoldmines.com. This is the Financial Survival Network, the information you need to thrive now more than ever. Well, I think I think gold is is going to be more or less okay in the short term. And I, mean, I talked about the stock markets having sort of a downward correction as a as a result of increasing interest rates. Ordinarily, that logic would apply to gold and basically any other asset classes that has benefited from monetary inflation. And so, uh, you would expect gold to go down as well. But there is, of course, a gold as as this reserve of safety in a sort of a panicked environment. And and I think as we see stock markets correct. A lot of people will be looking for some sort of safe haven to get out of it, and gold will seem to be something that uh, will lend itself to that. So, I don't think gold is going to have a big downward thing. I, I think once once the Fed starts up its QE again, I mean, basically, we're still in a QE phase now. They're still buying lots of bonds. They really haven't started to unwind all their purchases at all. Um, but once they start that up again, I think gold will have a be on its hair. Now, I don't know exactly when that will happen. I don't know when Jay Powell will throw in the towel. But once he does, I think gold will do very, very well indeed. And I don't think there's going to be as much downside there as you might have in the stock market or in tech stocks and stuff like that, as, as there is some quantitative tightening. Okay, next question for you, Octavio. Uh, we've had tremendous run-up in real estate prices. Should I sell my house or should I just refinance it? Well, now uh, the the 30-year mortgage rates in the U.S. have gone up. They're above 4% now. They're close to 4.2% now. Not so long ago, they were 2.8%. I believe that's going to have to impact the real estate prices because it's just become more expensive to buy real estate and, and, and credit is less available or it's available but higher prices. And that's going to continue. So as, as Powell increases interest rates, that's going to have a direct impact on mortgage rates and that will have a follow through effect on, on, on the real estate markets and will, will have an effect there. But bear in mind that the way the Fed has implemented its monetary policy has basically been in, in buying two types of bonds. It's been the US treasuries and mortgage backed securities. So there's been an enormous amount of liquid, liquidity that the Fed has pumped into the real estate markets through mortgage-backed securities quite directly. So it's a, a fairly direct conduit. So real estate prices have benefited more than anything else, really, from uh, monetary policy like, like the stock market has as well. So that's going to happen in reverse now. Uh, how fast that unwinds, I don't know. I'm surprised to see that stock, uh, real estate prices haven't started to come down more aggressively already in the US. But I think that's just a question of time. A few more months of this kind Kind of tightening, uh, increasing interest rates is going to have a very detrimental impact on 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 real estate. So, uh, what would I do if I was sitting on real estate in the U.S. at this stage and saying, "How do things look?" The problem is, you need a place to live, right? So, yeah, no, that's a you know. minor issue there. And uh, being a tenant really isn't fun because the rents are lagging the rising real estate prices. So, yeah, you'll have all this money that you made on selling your house, but you're going to pay 50% higher rents here in Florida. 
Yeah, I guess you could you could downgrade and get a smaller house, right? You could say, okay, this is maybe an opportunity to say, I'm just going to make do with a smaller dwelling and half the size, and and the kids have left or something like that. And and then when things go uh, hit the bottom, then I'll I'll step it back in if you want to really time the real estate market. Uh, but that's something that you know a lot of people think they're sitting on all this wealth from 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 real estate. It's a bit illusory in the sense that. Yeah, you can sell it, but then you need to buy something else to live in. And, and it's very hard to extract that value unless you, like I said, downgrade and, and get a smaller place to live. And that's what you'd have to do to make that work. So right. I wouldn't be too concerned about it. Yeah, you know, help with, you know, help at all, Octavia. Thanks for that. <laughs> I'm just going to sit put and I'm just going to stay put and worry about everything later. But it's it's a weird thing when you buy something and within eight, nine months, it's worth almost double what you paid for it. And if you have a mortgage, it's worth five times what you paid for it. That is, uh, you don't see that happen much in life for the average person. You know, you're a hedge fund. Hey, you're a member of Congress. It happens all the time. Miraculously, you get uh, 10 baggers just by being, uh, being in our uh, Congress. All these opportunities emerge. But uh, for the average Joe, not so much, huh? Well, I, I, you know, you, I think you raise a really good point. And in, in, in a certain sense, the Fed's policy uh, in terms of money has converted just run-of-the-mill people into highly leveraged speculators. I mean, you you mentioned like you know the value of new house has gone up fivefold, or you know your equity has gone up fivefold over the course of the past half year or something like that. Well, that of course can happen in reverse as well, quite easily in these kinds of markets and these kinds of uh, assets. So uh, everyone, even people just thinking of buying a home and house, are basically being handed a very speculative, highly leveraged investment without even knowing it. You've become an enormous risk taker, even though you didn't want to, you just wanted to buy a house and live in a place. But, but financially, you are like a little hedge fund, uh, highly leveraged, geared up. Yeah. So it's okay to be a risk taker, but you also got to be a risk manager. And that's what's that's the part of the equation that's missing for the average person. Uh, you don't really know how to hedge your risk. So if I don't want to move out of my house and I don't want to rent a house, how can I hedge real estate prices going down as a homeowner? Do I sell uh, the home builders short? Do I, what do I do? Uh, sell the bank short? Uh, I mean, the banks perhaps, I mean, that's sort of fairly diffuse some way of doing it. You could go short on real, real estate investment trusts and things of that sort. That would be a more direct way of doing it, I'd say. And and the home builders, yes, as well. So that would be the the, the short to that, that you could hedge some of that risk. Um, but that's that's pretty risky stuff as well. So. It's not it's not what I would recommend your run of the mill investor or, or to, to to sort of engage in in terms of uh, hedging strategies. There, it's just it's really difficult to do accurately uh, and, and and get that right. So you're you're basically I think have to sort of accept that there's a certain level uh, of heightened risk that you have to take as a result of this. Um, you know, you, you might you might think about someone just sitting on cash, and in the past that might have been a very safe thing to do, was zero return, but but fine, you 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 know the money's going to be there. Now not that so looks <laughs> not so much. It's a really really high high risk place to be. So what do you do? You well, you put the money to the markets, and you become a speculator, and and that's true in sitting on cash, on bonds, and real estate. Everything, so, everything has become high risk. So doing nothing is a risk. Doing something is a risk. But inflation for the average person who doesn't do anything, it's decimating. Their bonds take a hit. Potentially, the stock market can take a hit. But if you are a debtor buying up uh, assets that, uh, that you can then monetize, it's a godsend. Uh, absolutely. So for, for people who are in debt, it's if you're on fixed, a fixed uh, interest rate or more or less fixed sort of sticky interest rates, that not, that's not entirely variable. And it's great. So, so you can maybe sit on a big mortgage for an expensive house and you'll see inflation eat away your debt. And uh, that's really great. Of course, you're, if you're a saver, you're on the opposite end of the transaction and you're going to see your savings being eaten away. Um, and that is, I think, the, the really pernicious thing about inflation in general is that there's just a big shifting in wealth from 
people who've saved savers to people who are in debt and uh, uh, sort of unfairly punishing one group and rewarding another group by by doing that, that shift in love. And I think that's something that people overlook in terms of this. And uh, so the people who've taken on enormous amounts of debt can do incredibly well. And that's true of individuals and of companies as well. Yeah. So effectively, inflation penalizes savers, rewards borrowers, and that is the exact opposite behavior that an economy requires to prosper over the long haul. Uh, it's kind of like uh, doing that uh, crack, you know, uh, as long as it's not laced with fentanyl, feels pretty good until you find yourself addicted one day and you can't live without the stuff. And that's the problem with inflationary environments and debt. And the two go hand in hand. Octavio, we find you at opimus.com, correct? That's right, yes. All right. And there's a link in the show notes to this interview on financialsurvivalnetwork.com. Sign up for your free newsletter. You got a question for Octavio. Shoot me an email, please. KL at carrylutz.com. And Octavio, we'll talk to you again real soon. Thanks so much, Carrie. Take care. Thanks for listening to Carrie Lutz's Financial Survival Network, your solution to today's trying times. For the latest, go to FinancialSurvivalNetwork.com. Financial Survival Network, now more than ever.